Giant Virtue. Finn McDread slid the last ring of iron onto the barrel he was going to use for his next batch of cider. This was his fame in the lands of Armagh, where he overlooked Loch Ney. Drowning Finn Macduff in the Loch 110 years previously had been the triumph of his youth, but that had been overlooked by the humans, who only wanted to know how he made apples do something magical in his barrels. Macduff had tried to take his grazing lands and orchards by force, so it was inevitable that their battle would only end in death. This was a time when theft was punishable by death. Be it in a duel, or when men get their judges to rule against a thief. The humans liked to put the decapitated heads of those thieves on spikes outside their village walls to warn others not to try the same thing. Macdred didn't trust the humans, and the feeling was mutual. 250,000 cubits was the distance Finn McCool had travelled to greet McDread and barter some cider in exchange for bread and wolf skins. This was good business for them both. When they settled up, McDread directed them to hammocks slumped between apple trees to drink a couple of horns of cider together before McCool made the journey back to the north coast. I'm thinking about visiting Finn McDonard up in the Mourne Mountains. He has some good goat's cheese these days. I'm hoping he'll give them to me as a gift, now that I've rid Ireland of the threat of Benedonor. <clears throat> McDread grunted in assent, but inwardly groaned. This giant was becoming unbearable since his childish tricks to send Benedonor running back across the Irish Sea to Scotland. Who ever heard of a giant dressing up as a baby? A baby! What must that pretty wife of his think of her giant? And to add insult to injury... He was starting to call that broken bridge the Giant's Causeway. The cheek of it! If Benedonor heard the real truth over in Scotland, he'd be back with company to kill all the Irish giants, though Scots were undefeated after all. He needed to keep his big mouth shut. Tasting good? Pouring him more cider in the hope that it would shut him up temporarily. The next morning he was cooking his breakfast with a thumping headache when a delegation of humans arrived outside his cave. They always amused him with how polite they were to him, especially when he knew how they treated each other. Great Lord MacDread, we have come with a proposition. A man who seemed larger than the others and carried a shield and a sword in its scabbard. What sort of proposition? Are you trying to conduct business with me, pal? He snorted for effect and saw the man recoil. We'd like to give you gold in exchange for teaching us the magic that makes your apples become cider. What do I want with gold, little man? You can use it to make ornaments and rings. <laughs> rings! He laughed and picked his massive nostril. I'll tell you what. Make me a band big enough to go around this and then we'll have a deal. He pointed at his left bicep, which was as thick as a man's torso. The man conferred with his group and came back within a couple of minutes. All right, we have a deal. I need you to measure your arm with some rope so we can get the right size. Two weeks later, he was presented with a solid gold embroidered armband. It was actually very pretty, but he just <clears throat> grunted at them to keep the levels of fear sufficiently high as he put it on. These idiots sacrificed their children to their dumb gods and still believed that he was partial to eating the occasional human. But their meat wasn't very tasty compared to deer, sheep and cow meat. He spent the day showing them how to press the apples and then to use sugar to turn the alcohol for the cider. It was his accident of adding honey to crushed apples that started the fermenting process and made his name. His knowledge to them was like he'd invented fire and he got a funny sense of satisfaction from teaching them his skills. Perhaps this was what his forefathers had meant when they talked about virtue. 
A year later, McDreb was outside his cave, skinning a deer he had caught in one of his many traps laid in the nearby woods. He turned around to hear the sound of a band of little humans chanting as they approached his cave. Most of them had straight objects pointing above their heads, making them look taller. He had heard about these from his cousin Goliath, who had gone off to the hot countries to fight in battles, where they used these uh, spears, he recalled them being named. Were they coming to show them off to him? Greetings, he bellowed, given his ebullient pre-meal mood. His friendliness did not light up their faces. Instead, they started thrusting their spears at him. At him! McDread! What had he ever done to them? He had even helped them in the grasp of Gaelic, which was the language of the giants. Two spears struck him in his upper body, and a third one into his throat. Damn, these humans were good shots. As he fell to the ground, spluttering in his blood, their leader tore the golden band from his arm. He held it aloft and cried out, Ireland has one last giant now, thanks to our weapons. Let's go and make merry with our cider. They cheered and walked away, leaving death to quickly and remorselessly overcome Finn McDread.